Father, we thank you for your time together uh, here today with you, leading us, guiding us. We had a really great time, Father, of worship. It's not over because we worship you through our giving. We worship you through the announcements. We worship you through greetings. And now we're going to continue to worship you through your word. So bless your word to our hearts, Father, because we want to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to tell us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, if you have your notes, just take out your notes. It's in your bulletin. If you need one, just hold up your hand. We have Miles in the back, and he'll go ahead and pass to you the notes. I make out these notes because uh, just in case I forget my message at home, then I can at least look at the notes that you have. Yeah, so got to have a plan B, folks. Got to have a plan B. The Poison Wood Bible is a novel about Barbara Kingsover. It's about a family in 1959 who moved from the state of Georgia, USA, to a small village in Belgium, Congo, to serve as missionaries. Uh, the family is comprised of a husband, his name is Nathan, his long-suffering wife, Olena, and their four daughters, Rachel, who's the oldest, Leah and Ada are twins, and Ruth is the baby. Well, early one morning, the girls go out to the chicken coop, and uh, that's where they saw the vile creature that had been terrorizing the village for weeks. It was a green mamba snake. Green mambas are a combination of speed, camouflage, and deadly poison. The girls were brave, but they were also foolish. They chased after the snake and chased it out of the, the cage area, but... The little one, Ruth, was left behind, and as it was leaving the door, it went ahead and struck her, just as she was fleeing. And when the snake struck her or bit her, Ruth cried out briefly, but then death became instantaneous. The oldest daughter, Rachel, said this, and I quote, The whole world would change then, and nothing else would ever matter or be right again. Not for our family and especially not for, the, not for our, our mother's sake. For all the people in the world, worldwide, we might, I might add, might go on their business as usual. But for our family, nothing will ever be normal again. Rachel's sentiment about what happened to her sister, I think, reflects to many of us how we felt a few days ago. I'm thinking about Tuesday. When we heard about the tragedy in South Texas about how a person took a rifle and went in and slaughtered 19 kids and two adults. And now we're having to think about this on Memorial Day. The nation had to stop and mourn. They had to debate, analyze. And for just a brief moment, it happens. We talk about God and we ask the questions, why? And so you probably know people have asked you questions, why? Because you're Christians, you go to church. And uh, why? Why did this happen? How can God let this happen? And so forth. The shooter, who killed 19 children and two adults, was only 19 years old. That's it. And before his shooting, he posted three messages on Facebook. The first one was this, about 30 minutes prior, he said, I'm going to shoot my grandmother. And then a few minutes later, he posted this message, I shot my grandmother. And then just, just about 15 minutes before the massacre began, he says, I'm going into the elementary school and I'm going to shoot up everybody there. These were all private messages and the person who was supposed to receive these messages did not receive them until after the fact. One blessed child who was there at the time, who escaped by the grace of God, said to his parents, the shooter walked into the classroom and we heard him say these words, okay everybody, good night. Experts are saying that this was the, this was the cause of somebody suffering from mental health. I have to be honest with you, I decry that. I don't take a lot of mental health seriously. I really don't. Mental health conveys the idea that a person is not totally responsible for their actions. You know, it's partially his fault, partially the parent's fault. Partially his fault and partially environmental fault. Partially his fault and partially maybe he was born with a gene. Or maybe because he was bullied or maybe because he had drugs in him. You see what I mean? It kind of takes away the responsibility a little bit. 
I see it as he was responsible totally for what had happened. We can't blame guns. We can't blame the schools. We can't blame the teachers. We can't bl blame the parents. We can't blame the environment. We can't blame these things. It is his fault, his fault alone. Because only people use guns. The guns that we had 50 years ago are the guns that we had today. And things have gotten worse. Why? Because the guns have gotten worse? No, because people have gotten worse. Right? And that's the reason why. I like what it says in Ezekiel chapter 18. In your notes, if you want to follow with me, it says this. And God puts everything right on the sinner. It says, another message came to me from the Lord. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? And here's, the, here's what they were saying. Their parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouth pucker at the taste. In other words, whatever the parents have done, the children will bear the guilt. That's what they were saying. And God says this in verse 3, As surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel. For all people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. Watch this, verse 4. The person who sins is the one who will die. And then he gives an example. Suppose a certain man is righteous and does what is right and just. Verse 10, suppose that man has a son who grows up to be a robber or a murderer and refuses to do what is right. Should such a person live? No, God says. He must die and he must take full blame for his actions. But su suppose that sinful son in turn has a son who sees his father's wickedness and decides against that kind of life. Such a person will not die because his father sins. He will surely live. But the father will die for his many sins, for being cruel, robbing people, and doing what was clearly wrong among the people. You ask, what? Doesn't the child pay for his parents' sins? God says, no. If the child does what is right and keeps my decrees, my commandments, that child will surely live. The person who sins is the one who will die and bear the guilt. The child will not be punished for his parents' sins, and the parents will not be punished for the child's sins. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior, and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. In other words, you bear your own responsibility for the actions that you do. And so when we see these kinds of things, as horrific as they are, that person is responsible. Don't blame anybody else. Nobody else is to be blamed. It's not government's fault. Now, there are things that can contribute to these things. But in the end, we bear the responsibility and we bear the guilt, right? We kind of go to God and say, God, uh, it was my wife's fault. In fact, Adam did that, right? Didn't he do that? It was my wife's fault. And how far did that get him? It, get him, it got him kicked out of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> so we can't do that. Yeah, no, it's my responsibility. You see, nobody is immune from disaster. Disaster will come upon us at one time or another in varying degrees. It's inevitable. We live in a broken world. We see all the disasters and all the sadness on TV, the frustration and all the brokenness. But let me tell you this. God is not the author of evil, right? He's not the author of evil. He didn't cause what happened. In fact, God grieves over the atrocities that you and I grieve over and that we see. God is more offended at times at the things that we experience than we are. Ezekiel 18, 23 says this. Do you think, God is speaking, do you think I like to see wicked people die? No, I don't. Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. That's God's heart. How about this one, Matthew 22. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I want to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. But then he adds this, but you wouldn't let me. You see, I want to gather you close to me. But you said no. You're responsible. It wasn't because I didn't try, God says. I tried, but you said no. See, God allows people to choose. He forces no one to follow him. We have to make that choice. Everyone makes that choice out of their response and invitation to God. 
But let me just also say this. Even though we make those choices, God is still in full control of what goes on in the world. He's still on the throne. I have to admit that there's no real easy answers to when it comes to dealing with tragedy, but I also have to admit this, that we have an answer that's far more superior than any easy answer, and that's the offer of hope that God gives us. He offers us hope. The Bible prov provides that assur this assurance that no matter what happens in life, we can have peace with God. We can have the peace of God. In fact, Philippians 4 says it's called the peace that transcends all understanding. When we, when we understand that God will never let us down. God is around us and God is with us and God is in us. So here's what I want to do real quickly. I want to give you four principles on how you can handle tragedies in your life. And I want you to take these principles and I want you to apply them to your life just in case. It's going to happen. But I want you to apply these principles in your life. So have it written down. But I also want you to take these principles and apply them to somebody else's life. Because you're going to have people at work who are going to say things like, why? What happened? What's going on here? You can minister to them. You're going to have people in churches. You're going to have people at uh, restaurants, at the bus stop, in your own family gatherings when you're together. People are going to ask you questions because you are looked at as being close to God. Have answers. We need to have answers. We're not going to have solutions in, that, in terms of this not happening again. We're all going to suffer these things. But when they happen, we can have the answers because the Bible has the answers. Amen? Number one, the first principle. Talk to God about how you feel when things happen like this. What you think and how you feel. Talk to Him. Let God know how you feel. Be completely open and honest to God when you are frustrated. You see, tragedy brings strong emotions, right? So if you're, going through, if you're going to get through tragedy, you must be open and honest and free to be open and honest to God. And not worry that God's going to go like this. You know, squash you down. No, the Father doesn't, never does anything like that. You need someone to vent to. Someone who understands your pain, your frustration, your confusion, your anger. Because did not his son go through something like that? While he watched for three hours his son on the cross. While he watched his son get beat up and spit on and put the crown of thorns around. In fact, Isaiah tells us that when he put him on the cross in Isaiah 53 and in Psalm 22, that they could not count his bones because all of his bones were out of socket, out of joint. Isaiah 53 says that he had no form, no comeliness. What does that mean? That means when they looked upon him, they couldn't even tell if it was a man. Because when you're hanging on a cross and all your bones are out of joint, what kind of, what kind of form are you going to have? The father watched that. He understands your pain. He understands your heartache. In fact, let me just share this with you. Prophet, the prophet Habakkuk wrote these words. Habakkuk chapter 1. Now listen to this. He says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. He's venting. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there's no justice in the courts. The wicked outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. That's called venting. <laughs> Big time. And so how does God reply? Verse 5. Watch this. Amazing. The Lord replied, Look around the nations. Look and see and be amazed. For I am doing something in your days, something you wouldn't believe, even if somebody told you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Habakkuk, I see all this too. I see what's going on. In fact, I see it way before you even see it. But I want you to know this, Habakkuk, that as, I, as you see all these troubles going on around you, as you see all this wickedness going on around you, I am at work doing something behind the scenes that's going to make it all right again. Trust me. It's going to be right. It's going to be good. And when it's done, you'll be amazed. So 
so God doesn't rebuke him for his questions. God simply gives him a hope and appeal to trust him. You know, another favorite one of mine is John 11. When I first read this many years ago, I was confused as to what was happening here. But follow with me as I read John 11, the story of Lazarus. Remember that? A man, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sister Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Christ telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now watch verse 4. But when Jesus Christ heard about it, he said this, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it will happen for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now watch verse 5. Amazing. So although Jesus loved Martha, although Jesus loved Mary, although Jesus loved Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. <laughs> Isn't that kind of like, huh? Let me put it this way. Let's say that, okay, I live in Kaimaki. Okay. Somebody from this church calls me. Hey, Pastor Rich, so-and-so got in a terrible car accident. They're at Queens West. They're still alive, but they're in a coma. They're hanging on. The family's here. Can you come right away? And I say, I'll be there in two days. You, you, uh, would, you, would you understand that? You would think, what? Huh? No, you got to be here now. Well, this is what he's saying. He stayed where he was for two more days. What? You know why? I'll show you why as we go along. Then he said, finally, in verse 7, to his disciples, let's go. Two days is up, let's go. So now, now remember, it's not like driving in a car where you can get there in an hour. So it, took, it takes about two days from where he was to get to where he needed to be. And so he waited another two days, so that's four days. So he says in verse 11, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. And the disciples thought, oh, he's sleeping. And Christ says, no, he's not sleeping, he's dead. Lazarus is dead, verse 14. And then he says these amazing words. And for your sakes, verse 15, I'm glad I wasn't there. What? Why is he glad he wasn't there? I tell you why. Because when you read the Gospels, nobody ever died in the presence of Jesus. Nobody. He healed them all. And so Christ said, I'm glad I wasn't there because if I was there, Lazarus wouldn't have died. I have a plan. I have a plan. And it's going to be for your faith and something even greater, the glory of God. And so verse 32, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his, at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been there, my brother would not have died. So she confirms it. Everywhere you go, Lord, when people are with you, they don't die. They live. And when Jesus saw her weeping, he saw the other people wailing and so forth. Deep anger welled up within him. Not because of their weeping, but because he just hated sin and what sin was doing to people. And he hated the, the tragedies that were taking place. He was grieved. He was troubled. And he said, where, did you, where have you placed him? Where have you put him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, amazing passage, Jesus wept. Isn't that good to know? When you weep, when you weep, Christ weeps too. He weeps. He weeps. Still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone was rolled across the entrance. And so he says, take away that stone. And Martha said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. By now he stinks. He stinks, Lord. The smell is terrible. And Christ says in verse 4, didn't I tell you, if you just wait and see, you're going to see the glory of God. And then he prays with a loud voice. And then he yells out, Lazarus, come out. And guess what happens? He comes forth. Lazarus was healed, but not the way God intended. People wanted to go, Christ to save him or heal him before his death. God said, I got something better. I'm going to raise him from the dead. You see, we look at the plan of God and we say, Lord, let me counsel you how you need to do it. Yeah, yeah, you do it this way, Lord. Yeah, you know, 
I can, I can give you a couple of advices here. And God says, stop it. I will do things my way and it will be far greater. All I need for you to do is just trust me. Just trust me. So while you're trusting him, you're venting on him. Why, Lord? Why? How can this be? What's going on in this wicked world? Vent on him and he will just slowly and show you that I have it in, under control. It's under my plan. Like Matthew 5, 4, Christ says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You see, God, God blesses those who cry. God blesses those who are grieved. It's okay to mourn. God doesn't expect you to be happy all the time. Joy is always there, but the expression of it is going to be somewhat hindered when you're going through a trauma. It's okay to be honest with God with your feelings. It's okay. You can release it to God. I like what Jeremiah 12 verse 1 says. He says this, You are always, always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet, I would, seek, I would speak with you about your justice. In other words, you're, you're righteous and you're just, but let me give you some counsel. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are all the faithless living at ease? <laughs> yeah? Don't you have that question at mind? All the time. But go ahead and vent on God. Go ahead and express your emotions and your thinking to God. He can handle it. Remember this, the Bible says that we are not to lay our, carry our burdens ourselves, but to lay them on the shoulders of Jesus, right? Bear his, let him bear your burdens and so forth. Matthew chapter 11, his shoulders are much bigger. Let him carry your load. Don't carry yourself. Give it to him. Number two, don't allow bitterness and anger to take up residence in your heart. Life is going to throw you some curveballs. Don't allow bitterness and anger to get the best of you. You're going to have close friends and they're going to be a Judas to you. Don't allow that to dissuade you. You're going to have people that you, could, you thought you could trust are going to turn on you. Don't let bitterness cause you to well up inside with anger and frustration. You're going to watch the news, and if watching the news causes you to have high blood pressure, stop watching the news. Turn off the TV. Watch Sesame Street instead. Look at Hebrews 12, 15. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up and trouble you, corrupting many. That's what happened to the shooter. Over time, he, instead of releasing it to Christ because he didn't know God, he just took it upon himself and kept it in himself, and then one day it exploded into that massacre. The minute you become bitter, the devil gets a foothold in your life. You gotta watch that. In a short amount of time, your soul will be poisoned because of that bitterness. And it won't just stay there a move. You will inflict pain upon others, abuse and hurt because of all that pain and all that trouble that's in there. And Christ says something that is impossibly hard. He said this in Luke 6. He says, I tell you this, hear me out. Love your enemies. <laughs> I say, Lord, sometimes I have trouble loving my kids. <laughs> Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. Yeah, that's the way. That's the way to deal with bitterness. You know, I, you see, sometimes, folks, listen real quickly. Sometimes when we pray, we have in mind we're praying for that person. But you know what prayer also does? It changes you. You see, sometimes God says, pray for you. When God says, pray for your enemies, yeah, he's, he has in mind the enemies, but he also knows that if you pray for your enemies, they're not the only ones that's, that's going to change. In fact, they may never change. They may stay the same, but you will change. And when you change, guess what? Your circumstances change. Your perspective change. And you know what? No longer they're your enemies. Why? Because did, did they change? No, you change, and you see them differently. That's why you pray. Is it wrong to want revenge? Yes. Because revenge is not our responsibility. Revenge is the responsibility of God. And so it's not your job to get revenge. Like the story of this soldier who was fighting over in Iraq, who received a letter from his girlfriend. It's a Dear John letter, breaking up with him. 
In the letter, she asked him to return the little picture that she gave him because she wanted to use it for her bridal announcement. Well, the soldier was heartbroken and crushed. And he shared it with his friends, other platoon members. And they came together and they said, we have an idea. So they got all their pictures together from their girlfriends and they gave it to him. And they said, send these pictures of our girlfriends to your girl, ex-girlfriend and say these words. For the life of me, I can't remember which picture is yours. <laughs> so, re so please remove your picture from these and send me back the rest. <laughs> I, you know, revenge is not something we should do, but sometimes you just kind of like, yes, yeah. so maybe that kind of revenge, I don't know, but uh, I don't know. Just pray about it, okay? Just pray about it. It's not, it's not natural to forgive those who do bad things. It's impossible. But you know what? With God, with God, it's, it's possible. So number one, talk to God about how you feel. Number two, don't allow anger and bitterness to reside in your heart. And then number three, run to God for safety. Run to God for safety. There's no such thing as a safe place. You like the man, you heard about the man who read that 85% of all accidents happen at home, and so he moved. <laughs> you know, there's no safe place here on earth, right? Except in the Lord. Except in the Lord. I like what we see in Psalm 46. Psalm 46 says this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with its surging, we will trust in God because He is our refuge and our strength. A refuge was an elevated place back during that time where people could run to from their enemies. And they could see all around them and they knew they were safe because they were elevated high. And basically what this passage is saying is that God is your place where you can run to. When you have no other place on earth to run to, you run to God because He's on high. He's on high. I think most people instinctively understand this reality because the first words that a lot of people say when tragedy hits or when they hear about tragedy is, my God, right? <laughs> Those words may be reflexive, but they do make sense because who else are you going to call when tragedy hits? Where else are you going to go to? My God. Christ said this in Matthew 10. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. But be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul where? In hell. Don't be afraid of the terrorists. Don't be afraid of the bully at school. Don't be afraid of that vindictive person. Don't be afraid of all the shootings that go here and not go there and so forth. Even organizations like Al-Qaeda. Those attacks, although they can hurt your body, will never able to touch your soul. Never. So when we run to God, we can have the knowledge that no matter what happens in this life, if I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time, from my perspective, or from the world's perspective, that's okay, because God has my soul. Nobody can touch that. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you don't need to be afraid, you're safe. You're safe. And God opens up as a refuge to us. You can run to God. So when I face tragedy, what do I do? What should I do? I release my emotions to God. I tell Him how I feel. Number two, I don't let bitterness take a hold of my heart. And number three, I run to God for safety and for, to Him alone. And then here's the fourth one. I rely and trust on God's character. Rely and trust. I am doing something in your world that you don't know of, God is saying. Trust me. You can count on me. God never changes, right? Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, don't change. There's a book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. And it's a book about what really the title is. It's about crying, weeping. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed by the enemy. 
Jeremiah was upset because not only was the city destroyed, but people's hopes and dreams were also destroyed. And so he writes these words in a moment of anxiety, in a moment of destitute, where things just doesn't seem like there's much hope. He writes in Lamentations 3, verse 21, these words, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. How so, Jeremiah? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait upon him. And just like the sun rises constantly every day, right? Every day. It's been rising every day since I've been alive. We can count upon God's mercy to be new every morning. It's going to, just like the sun is going to be there, God's mercies will also be there too. Psalm 11 verse 3, people that lived thousands of years ago, how did they handle crisis? They asked this, this, this question, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? When life seems to be hopeless, when things seem to be helpless, what can the righteous do? What, where can they turn to? Verse 4 of Psalm 11 says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. God watches everything closely. He is still ruling from heaven. It may not look like it at times, but God is ruling from heaven. He has everything under control. So, you know what? Stop looking at your circumstances and start looking at God. Remember Peter walking on water? Remember that incident? He walks on water, and, uh, and for a brief moment, he had victory. He was walking on water. I like that because that tells me, remember, he became afraid when he saw the waves, and he heard the wind, but he was walking on the waves. He was walking on the water. You see, if you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you will walk on your circumstances. When you take your eyes off of your circumstances or, 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 or off of Jesus onto your circumstances, you will what? But if you keep your eyes on Jesus, he will raise you high enough where your circumstances will be under your feet. And you will be walking on your circumstances, on your fears. You know what I mean? The waves, the wind, he was walking on the waves. He was walking on the rough sea until he took his eyes off, off of Christ and then Christ had to go there and raise him up. And by the way, when he said, Lord, save me, notice how fast Christ was there? It wasn't like, okay, I'll be there in three minutes. And he was like, Lord, save me. Okay, I got you. <laughs> that fast. Let me real quick as I end. Let me give you four things that you can always count on God for. Four things that will never change in life. Four things. Number one, God's love for you will never change. Number one. Jeremiah 31 3 God says I love you with an everlasting love notice that an everlasting love so once he starts loving you he can't stop it's everlasting God loves you more now than he will ever because his love for you now is just as constant as it will be forever it never changes number two God's word will never change Psalm 40 verse 8, the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. What is God's word? His promises to us. All of his promises to us that we claim, that we embrace, will never change. God will, you'll never hear God say, you know what, I, I don't feel like it anymore. You'll never hear that. His change are constant. His, 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 his promises, his word is constant. It will never, never falter, nor will it fail. Number three, God's purpose never changes. Psalm 33, 11 says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purpose of his heart through all generations. Remember Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you. Here it says the plans will never change. I like that. So he has a purpose for your life, and you cannot mess it up. Unless, of course... You do mess it up, but then his purpose for your life is whatever he has afterwards. He just knew beforehand what you were going to do. Remember, his mercies are new every morning. New every morning. 
And then number four, God's concern for you never changes. I like that. Matthew 10, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. What are you saying? He's saying God pays so much attention to birds. Sparrows. You know the kind that we used to shoot with BB guns when we were kids? <laughs> you know? He pays close attention to sparrows. And if he, plays, if he plays or pays that much attention to sparrows, how much more to you who made in the image of God? That's how much concern he has for you. And it will never, ever change. Never. In the early days at Ground Zero in Manhattan, New York, shortly after the events of the World Trade Center, there was a cross of steel beams that was found amid the rubble during that time. It was not constructed by anyone. Nobody put that cross there. The beams just broke off that way when one of the towers fell and it formed a cross when it landed. It was said that this cross brought hope and comfort to people as they were cleaning up, looking for bodies, looking for survivors. And as they would look for survivors, many of the workers will be just totally without strength, totally just destitute, totally tired. And they would go and they would sit down by this cross that was formed by, some would say by accident, we know why it was formed. And they would just sit there and they would look at the symbol for strength and hope during those times. You see, the cross of Christ is a permanent symbol of hope for every person, every age. It's odd that as Christians, our hope is an old, rugged, wooden instrument of torture that the Savior bled and died. How could that offer hope to anybody? It's strange how God works. Well, the reason is quite simple. This symbol of hope is a symbol of hope because of what happened 2,000 years ago when the Son of God Himself died on that cross for our sins. And He took upon Himself the, the pain of sin, sin itself, all the sins and tragedies of mankind, He took upon Himself. So whenever we see the cross, we remember not so much the instrument or the, the, the symbol, but we remember the person who died on the cross, Christ Jesus. You see, whether it's at Ground Zero in Manhattan, whether it's at an elementary school in South Texas, or whether it's on a hill called Golgotha in the first century, the cross still stands today, folks, as a symbol, as a symbol of hope to all of us. How about you? Do you need hope? Do you need a place of refuge? I want to invite you. Come to Jesus. His arms are stretched wide because isn't that what the cross does? Stretches people out like this or stretches the person out. His arms are stretched wide and he welcomes you to come into his fellowship. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to give you an opportunity to come to Jesus. The Bible says if you hear the Lord speaking to you, don't harden your hearts. Because you see, this opportunity of coming to Christ may not happen again. You don't know what's going to happen when you step out this door. Not wishing anything bad upon anybody. But you just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whether or not you're going to be around the next Sunday. We just don't know. Those children, elementary uh, children, didn't know what was going to happen to them when they went to school. And so make the most of this opportunity right now. If Christ is calling you, come to the cross. You say, how do I do that, Pastor Rich? It's very simple. Remember, salvation is a gift. It's not of works. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You simply have to open up your heart and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me for all the bad and wrong things I have done. And I invite you to come into my life and my heart and be my Lord and Savior. 
the Bible says he stands at the door and knocks if anybody opens the door he will come in and will fellowship with you and you with him but you have to open the door he won't bust it open you have to make it happen will you do that today as every head is bowed and every eye closed just say it in your own words that simple prayer Lord Jesus Lord Jesus I know I'm a sinner I invite you to come into my life and my heart and he will the Bible says all who call upon me I will save that's a promise and remember his word stands forever Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. Oh, we had such a tremendous time of singing. We need time to sing, Lord, because the only alternative to singing is crying. We're not crying people, Father. We're joyful people. There are things in life that do want to make us cry, but not for long. Because weeping takes place during a day but joy comes in the morning so we thank you for the joy Lord of your word the joy of the fellowship of your people the joy of knowing you as Lord and Savior and we pray father for those who are in our midst who might be either here or out there we pray father that they too who do not know Christ may have that opportunity where they can have the joy that we can have as that we have as well the joy of knowing you Yes, we don't like what we see. We hate what we see. We want godly men and women in leadership in our government who can make changes, Father. And sometimes they just don't get in. And we think, oh no, another round of two years of this, another round of four years of this. And we get really frustrated inside and we say, oh Lord, the gas prices are going up and the prices of food is going up. We can't buy food for our, our cakes. We can't buy, we can't even buy uh, formula for our babies, Lord. We can't even pay our rent. We can't even buy a house. And we live here. And we complain a lot. But Father, in the end, our citizenship is in heaven from which we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will one day come and transform our vile and mortal bodies and transform it to like His glorious body. <laughs> So, thank you for letting us vent, Lord. And now take over. Take over, Father. Because when we are in charge, things happen that are bad. When you're in charge, you're in charge for the glory of your own self and of your Son. We love you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. In Christ's name and church, we say together, Amen. Amen. Let's give him a nice hand clap.